Um, hello, I'm Dennis, and this is Continuable Asynchronous Programming with Allocation Aware Futures. So, first of all, about, um, first of all um, something about me. I'm a master's student at the Technical University of Munich. I was a Google Summer of Code participant last year at the HPX project of the Stellar Group. I'm the author of the Continuable and Function 2 libraries at GitHub, and I'm personally interested in compiler engineering, asynchronous programming, and metaprogramming. So, th this talk will be about my Continuable library. You can find it on GitHub. So, first of all, I will talk about the future pattern and its disadvantages. Then we're thinking about how we could possibly improve futures. I will introduce my Continuable implementation and I will show you some usage examples of Continuable. Then we are going through connections, how we connect Continuables to each other and how we can create such connections easily. Then I will show you some examples about how you can express connections with Continuables. And the last topic will be about interoperability of the Continuable library and coroutines. First of all, the future pattern. So, probably everybody has seen this before. Hands up. Good one. Okay, so usually the future can be used to express the result of an asynchronous operation. The asynchronous operation can um, finish with, with a result or not, then the result will be void. So we need some primitive we can use to immediately use the value which will be produced in the future. For that, we have the std future, and to resolve the std future, we are having the promise. So the promise can create a future and resolve it. Usually, probably, you're using the std future like this. You're creating the future from the promise, then you're setting the um, value of the future through promise.zValue, and then you're waiting um, for the future in a synchronous manner. So in C17, we can only do this. This is obviously bad because it will block the current thread, and um, threads are quite expensive. <coughs> Usually, future implementations feature another way of waiting for a future. It's called the future.then method. The future.then method accepts a callback, which then accepts the future again, and it will be called as soon as the future becomes ready. If the future is ready, if, and the handler was chained through then, and um, yeah, the future is ready, then um, future.then will call the callback immediately. So this was also proposed in the concurrent CTS, but Actually, it turned out that this is now heavily reworked in the Unified Futures and Executor proposal, and I think we can't like, get it until C++23, and I'm also not really sure about whether we will get it in, in this way. Uh, one addition, um, you can, <clears throat> if you're joining like, um, the handler to the future, you can return the next future from the callback, and um, this will be resolved next. So this will create then another future. So the future and the promise are both connected to a shared um, state on the heap. So both need to have like some, some class they are linking to. Otherwise, there couldn't be um, it wouldn't be possible that they both like communicate with each other. The naive approach of implementing such a shared state looks like this. We have some joint storage, which can hold nothing, or the result, or an exception pointer, which usually indicates that the asynchronous operation has failed with some error. Then we are having some um, storage for the callback. Usually, like probably it's something more improved than as std function, but here it fits the purpose perfectly. And then we need um, a synchronization primitive to guard the shared state against race conditions. We could possibly access the shared state for many threads. Keep that in mind. As I said before, std future is currently is really limited, but there are other future implementations like the boost future, the folly future from Facebook, the HPX future, or the SDLab future, which was um, presented last on your last year's meeting 
P4. So the shared state comes with some overhead. As I said before, um, we need to store the continuation and those attaching a continuation to then always creates a new future and state shared state every time. So this produces an, an immense amount of allocation overhead. Then we also need to allocate maybe for the continuation as well if it doesn't fit into the small buffer of, of our storage. Usually result reading and writing is not weight free, which means yeah, we can't ensure that, that, that waiting on a result proceeds in a fixed amount of time because we are usually require a lock acquisition or um, a spin lock. And, but one optimization hint, this can be optimized in a way that we are um, doing weight free <coughs> operations in case we have the single consumer and producer case. So this is a non-shared future and promise. So which means that not more than one single producer or, and one single consumer accesses the shared state at one time. And there's another alternative um, for futures that are not shared across multiple cores, so no data races can occur, the future and promise pattern can implement it um, at zero cost actually, and this is implemented in the CSTAR framework. Another disadvantage of the future is its eager evaluation semantics, which means futures represent like an asynchronous result of an already running task. So you can't stop it, and it's also impossible not to request it. So think about, yeah, like if you see you don't need the, the, the result of the operation anymore. Yeah, the future is already running. You can't stop it, except if you implement some, some, some manual cancellation mechanism. And its execution is non-deterministic, which means it could lead to unintended side effects of your, in your program um, because you can't ensure the execution order. So the naive approach in solving this would be like you could possibly um, wrap the callback um, into a lambda to achieve laziness. You would then just invoke the lambda and this would then schedule the operation of the future. But it, produces code overhead and it doesn't look that nice. So yeah, it also doesn't sound like a real solution for the problem. Then we have a problem with future.then. Future.then is designed as a consuming method, which means it invalidates the future itself. So you shouldn't access the future after that anymore because it was moved to some other place. <coughs> the fix for that would be you should qualify the future.then method as error value callable only. Later I will show you an example about this. And future.then always, uh, the, the lambda that you pass to future.then always accepts the future itself. And then you need to access the future in order to get a value. So this could lead to immense um, overhead you have to write, or code overhead you have to write, because you have to unwrap the arguments first. So in this example, actually, I think you need three calls to get for, for, for each future to get its result, and that's, that's an immense overhead. Um, but the advantage of this is that you have the ability to do fine-grained exception control, which means you can, can react on exceptions that are thrown more precisely. Ah, and this becomes even worse um, when, when, when we have like compound types um, that are that are produced like in, when, you, when you are connections or connecting certain futures together. Then we have the ability in, um, as the diff, or in the future pattern that we can um, terminate um, an asynchronous operation with some exception. And for, uh, here we can produce um, ex an exceptional future usually to make exceptional future and this will then continue with the future, and the exception is redrawn as soon as you are calling the dot, that, the dot get method. <coughs> and then the, future, uh, the exception is rethrown again, and this passed to another handler, and then it is rethrown again. And obviously, uh, this is not good, because exceptions are producing overhead. For instance, um, for, for the... Um, 
yeah, for destroying like the objects like stack unwinding. And um, so exceptions are usually implemented in a manner uh, which allows them to stay zero cost as long they are not thrown. And here they are thrown multiple times. Then there's another disadvantage, like you can't use just like another or a different exception type, like error codes, for instance. And then I think the most, um, the, the largest disadvantage of the future pattern is its availability. Like as I said before, future.then will, or std future.then will change heavily and the standardization date is not known. And this will be reworked again in the unified future proposal, which we maybe can expect at C++ 23. So I told you about other implementations and the disadvantage of those other implementations is that they usually are requiring a larger framework, runtime or are really difficult to build. So it's not something you can embed easily into your application. So I've shown you the disadvantages and now we are thinking about how we could possibly improve those futures. So a few design goals could be, yeah, it should be usable in a broad case of usage scenarios. So some of you are using Boost, some of you are using Qt, some of you are using like in-house frameworks. And the library should, in an optimal case, work together with all of this. So it should be portable and platform independent and actually simple to use. So also it should be really agnostic to user provided executors and runtimes because usually you are running your own executor already in your application and it should really take that into account. And of course it should resolve the previously mentioned disadvantages like the shared state overhead, strict eager evaluation, unwrapping and R value correctness, exception propagation and the availability. It should be available now because <coughs> yeah, we need it now and we want to use it now. Now, wait, why we aren't using callbacks just to like express um, how an asynchronous operation has ended? And there's an obvious simple answer for this. It's like, it's really complicated to express um, complicated asynchronous continuation chains through callbacks. There's also um, the principle of a callback hell. Um, probably you have heard about it, that the callbacks are nested more like um, into each other and this produces a an immense amount of unreadable code actually. But callbacks are simple and performant to express an asynchronous continuation. So, and also they work nicely with existing libraries. The idea could be that we transform the callbacks into something easier to use without a callback hell. So this has a long history in JavaScript. For instance, there are frameworks like Q and Bluebirds which transform callbacks nicely, so, so, you, so you can use them actually. But it turns out that this is much more complicated in C++ because of static typing. And it requires heavy metaprogramming. The idea could be also that we mix this with syntactic sugar and C++ candies like op operator overloading, and then our library would be finished, right? But it turns out this is not really trivial, and I will guide you through this process. So I came up with this solution. A continuable can be created through a call to make continuable. Make continuable accepts an arbitrary amount of asynchronous return types, so you can even have multiple return types. And make continuable accepts a call uh, a callback which then accepts the promise itself. The promise can be moved or stored, or the promise can be even dropped if you don't want to kin continue the, continu the current asynchronous chain. Then we could resolve the promise to a call to promise.setValue. And it turns out that this is just an alias for the call operator. So a promise is still a callable object. A ready continuable um, just like resolves instantly, which means, um, yeah, it's, it's like every other continuable just, yeah, that is, it resolves uh, instantly. And then we can just um, go ahead and chain our continuation handler to the continuable. So 
The difference between this and the future pattern is that we are accepting the values directly. So no unwrapping is needed anymore. And then we could possibly return some values from our callback, like plane objects or a tuple of objects or the next continuable to resolve. In my examples, like methods or functions like HTTP request are just here for example purposes. They are not um, provided as part of the library. So here, HTTP request um, yields two um, asynchronous arguments, like the status and the body. We could then go ahead and just return the next continuable to resolve. We could even like just pass the continuables directly to the dot then method if we want to ignore the previous result. And I mentioned some syntactic sugar here. Like we could even just accept arguments of the previous asynchronous operation partially. So here the make ready con or the continuable, which is produced from make ready continuable, has three asynchronous um, result types, like a character and two integers. And in our callback, we are just accepting our character. So this would be normally a compile error, but the library handles that for you. You can just accept a partial um, set of the arguments. And as I said before, we could even go ahead and then just return multiple objects from the callback, which will then pass instantly to the next con um, callback. But how does this work? So first of all, as I said, a make already continuable is just a continuable which yields its results instantly. And it could be implemented like that. Like make continuable, then our um, arguments, and then um, it resolves the promise with those values. And uh, you can't like just transform the code like this. Actually, the implementation is using a tuple, which then stores those arguments and then just uses a std apply to reapply those arguments to the promise. So <clears throat> then we are expecting that every callback just returns a continuable. So callbacks with sh which return void would then just um, return a ready continuable of zero arguments, whereas a callback that um, returns a set of arguments or asynchronous return types would then just resolve in a ready continuable which has those asynchronous return types. But we, again, we can't just rewrite the code. We have to um, use meta programming somehow to decorate this. And the implementation is using tech dispatching for this. So first of all, we are computing the, um, the result of the callback when, when it is invoked with the given arguments. So this is result t here. Take the tuple of two integers, for instance. Then we are retrieving some invoker, which is then responsible for decorating the result. And here the tag dispatching is used. We instantiate an identity, which is templated with the result, and then um, um, argument specialization here comes in place. So usually Z++ here um, just tries to, to, to find a method which is specialized most. And this is like the, 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 um, the function here which contains the tuple, <coughs> like the first implementation. And then it um, res um, returns the correct invoker for decorating the result. So attaching a continuation to then works as following. We have the continuation and then again, it just accepts a promise and then it will resolve the promise somehow. And we have the callback which always returns a continuable. We can then produce a new continuation with continuable.then through um, through, through setting as a, as a lambda, which then accepts the next callback. The next callback is then decorated with the current callback. And um, it is wrapped nicely again as a proxy. The proxy will contain like the whole magic which is used, for instance, for the partial <coughs> argument application. And then the current continuation <laughs> is invoked with the proxy. And the proxy looks like this. Again, 
it contains like the callback and the next callback as capture. And the next continuation can be received through invoking the current callback with the arguments of the previous continu continuation. And the next continuation will then be invoked with the call next callback. I know, like this is somehow complicated, and <clears throat> but if you want to try um, or see a, a bigger picture of this, I would describe us at following as it as following. So the current continuation is invoked with the next callback. And the next callback will then return the next continuation, which is then invoked with the next callback, which then again will return the next continuation. So the result of the topmost continuation um, is actually then passed to the last callback in this chain, like here. So this is somehow recursive, so that um, actually if you chain like um, and the callback to the continuation, it, it will go to the bottom of the asynchronous call stack somehow. And actually, you probably know this principle from somewhere, so wrapping something into something. And the Russian Matroshka doll actually is not that somehow different because we are putting a smaller Matroshka doll into a, a medium-sized one and then the medium-sized one into the largest one. And the largest Matroshka doll actually just um, hides what is in it. So you are just, um, you just don't know what is happening inside the continuation and it can hold any arbitrary logic inside. So actually continuable also supports exception handling. And you can then just chain exception handlers through a call to um, continuable.fail, which then accepts a callback that when invoked accepts an exception pointer and you can then work with the exception itself. So the exception can be set through calling promise.setException. And it is implemented in a way that will route the exception through until the first failure handler uh, occurs. So you can see it like this. We have two control flows. W one control flow for results and one control flow for exceptions. You can change between those control flows and if you want to go from the result flow to the exception flow, you will just throw an exception. And if you want to go backwards, we are just using recover. Currently, recovering is not implemented in the library, but throwing is. So for this, we have to change the type of our callback. From now on, a callback will provide two call operators. One is call operator is for the result, and one call operator is for the exceptions. We would then disambiguate both call operators by one tag, and I call it the dispatch arrow tag. And the, the exception pointer is just following after the dispatch arrow tag. And it turns out that you can use any other type for exceptions, um, then, then the exception pointer. So you are not limited to some type which has special semantics. And it turned out that the um, standard committee actually, like in the unified future proposal, are coming up like somehow now with the same solution and they call it the exception arc T for, for the dispatch arrow tag. So we implement the exception propagation as following. Like when we want to chain an exception handler, we would then just go ahead and forward every valid result to the next handler because the asynchronous argument types don't change when we just append another failure handler. Or when we just append a failure handler, the result won't change. But here we need to handle um, failures. So here we are storing the failure callback and then we are just passing our exception to the failure callback. For result, it's the same, but like in swapped order. We would just handle every result while routing exceptions to the next available failure handler. 
or to the next handler and then the next handler will, if it doesn't handle the exception, even forward the exception to the next handler. So as of now, we were just working with plain um, callable objects that, that didn't provide any method. And for this, we need some class. I call it the continuable base. The continuable base has two um, template arguments. One is for the continuation itself. That was the one I was showing you. And then there is the strategy. The strategy will be explained later when, I, when it comes to connections. The continuable base stores the current continuation and some kind of an ownership. The ownership is used to detect whether the continuable base is still valid, so it wasn't moved out, and um, I will use that later. And then there is the .then method, which accepts the callback and an executor. The executor is defaulted to just use an executor which invokes the continuation on the current thread. And what is really different from the std future .then or any other dens which are implemented in future libraries, this library is qualified as error value callable only, which means you have to move it first before you can use it, or you are using it because like the result came back from, from, from a, a function invocation, so it's in an error value context. And what is really important, Continuable bases are convertible to each other when the continuation is convertible to each other. And keep that in mind because we, it will be really important later. So the ownership, as I told you, it tracks whether the continuable base is still valid at some time, point of time. And it is used, <coughs> so currently we were just building up the continuations, but we didn't invoke them. And here for the ownership is used. If you see that the continual base is destroyed and the ownership is still valid, so it's, it's definitely the last continuable base which we, which we um, compo uh, composite together. So then we would just go ahead and invoke the whole continuation chain. So it's an invocation on destruction. And because we know like the whole um, continuation chain, when the object is destroyed, this is race condition free. So, which means we don't need to, to um, like synchronize the continuations together and so they don't like interfere with each other when we add them from different threads. And this is a really good thing. So, as of now, there was mo no memory allocation involved. So, because then always returns an object of an unknown type. But this increases the amount of types the compiler has to generate, and the compilation gets slower. So, this is better for compiler optimization, because the compiler can see much better what is going in on inside those, or inside those continuations. So, <coughs> but this increases also the executable size overall. So, well, what we want now is like a concrete type for an API, which we can possibly use to expose our implementation. So this would work like that, that we are having unknown types in a compilation unit and a concrete type in our header or API. It would look like this. So now the, co the concrete type, I call it continuable. Again, it just it, um, has like the asynchronous return types as, as template arguments. And then you can just assign a lambda to it or a callable object which accepts a, an arbitrary promise. I could have used auto for the promise type here, but um, you can all also have a concrete type for promises. And then you would then go ahead and work with the concrete promise just like you would um, work with it like when it's an unknown object. So both they, they both provide the, the same methods basically. And the thing about this is that we preserve the unknown type across the continuation chaining, but then we convert it explicitly to a concrete type in APIs on request. So it is, we, I implemented this, it as following. So again, we have like some kind of a callback type, and as I mentioned before, it has the following signature. So again, we are accepting <coughs> a set of valid result types, 
and this dispatch error tag and the exception pointer for the for the error flow. And this looks quite similar, like we could use it like in a std function, right? So the optimal wrapper for this would be some 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 kind of a callable type erasure, I call it. But it turns out that std function is not capable of holding such a callable object because our callbacks are usually non-copyable and also we have to we have multiple signatures we have to dispatch. But um, in the past, I've written a library which does exactly this, and it's called function two, which provides an alternative to std function, but it can also hold move-only types and can dispatch multi-signatures, and um, it supports also co a small function optimization, which means that we don't have to always allocate like memory on the heap for storing our callbacks. It could also possibly fit in the small buffer of the function. So we would here align some um, the memory allocation. But it's not like always sure that this happens. It really depends like on the callback. And for the continuation itself, it will just be some, some function which accepts the callback. The erasure for this is quite simple. For the promise, we have some kind of a promise base and um, then, then it wraps like the, the, the type erasure wrapper nicely. And for the continuable, like this is the continuable base I talked about before. So a continuable is just a continuable base which defines a type erasure that then will accept the promise. And again, continuables are convertible to each other when the continued continuation itself is convertible to each other, which means this works out of the box and with any type erasure wrapper of your choice. So you don't have to stick to my function two library. Actually, you could just go ahead and replace it. So now we are comparing the amount of heap allocations continuable is doing against the amount of um, heap allocations futures are usually doing. Again, here we are chaining a continuable with two um, callbacks. And it turns out that only max a maximum of two allocations are needed here. And I said maximum because, yeah, it still could fit in the small buffer of the, um, of the function erasure. Whereas when we compare it against the future, future requires an immense amount of, um, of, of memory allocations. So do something here also returns a future which also has its own shared state. And then we go ahead and call dot then, then we are storing the callback in the shared state, which will then also allocate. And then from dot then we are returning another future with, which has another state. And here in this example, like we are having six memory allocations where continual just does two and on request. Um, one thing, like um, in my benchmark, it has shown that this uh, um, that the approach, like when eliding like the heap allocations, has, has better performance than than uh, just allocating a shared state like for every future. As I told you before, there's also support for executors, so you can adapt like the continuals to your runtime. And an executor could be possibly used for, for, for three adaption points. One thing is, when do you want to run the callback? Shall we, or where are we running the um, callback? Shall we run it on the resolving thread? This is the default case. Or shall we run it on a thread like that created the continuation? So then there's the question about when does the continuation run? immediately on resolving or later or can we even cancel it and this should be really up to you so continuable provides a facility for you the executor interface where you can adapt this behavior an executor can be used if you just chain it to or it's it's a second argument to the dot then method <coughs> an executor is just another callable object which then 
accepts another callable object. It's called the work. So you can just invoke the work and it will continue the chain. The work can be dropped also, or the work can even move to another thread or executor. Usually you are using the executor um, argument for proxying the work to somewhere else. The library doesn't support executor propagation, which means you always have to um, provide the executor argument again when your chain got callback through then. And the reason for this is that it's not that um, easy to store the executor inside the continuable without like that it leads to type erasures that happen like below the point of chaining. So storing the executor in, in the continuable, it would like maybe require another argument or we are just storing it as type of a the type erasure, but this is, it's not an ideal solution. So this is not supported. And again, I, I could think about that maybe we could add it as an argument in the continual base, but I'm also not sure about this. But it turns out that this isn't that, this isn't that bad because usually you are using callbacks for only short work where you just schedule the next operation that should be continuing. And in the continuation, you, you are running long-term tasks. <coughs> so we can actually neglect like executor propagation when, when, we, when we are implementing it like that, that, um, that short actions or short, um, or short taking code for the callback and long taking code for the continuation, then it should be fine. So now we are checking our design goals. So we have no shared state overhead. Let's go check. No strict EGR evaluation, which means, yeah, we are using lazy evaluation <coughs> and evaluation on request semantics, but this could be also converted to eager evaluation um, if you want that. And we don't unwrap argument or we are unwrapping arguments automatically and dot then is only callable from an error value context. So we have fixed the error value correctness also here. The exception propagation is fixed because we are effectively routing the exception to the next available failure handler. And the availability is quite good because I implemented it in SSZ++14 library and it's header only. It only depends on my function to library, which is also only header only. And it compiles on a fairly new compiler um, and like all the major compilers are supported. <coughs> now I want to talk about connections. Usually connections are used to, to connect continuals to each other. There's the well-known when all method, which connects multiple continuals or futures together, depends on the context. And the, the when all will then return a continuable, which becomes ready as soon as all dependent continuables have become ready. When any, whereas, um, returns a future which becomes ready when all the continuables or when, when only one continuable which w w on which it depends becomes ready. So usually we use both of them to express relations um, in, in our asynchronous call hierarchy. This approach um, sadly is, or the continuable approach sadly is not usable where you are using some guided or graph-based execution because this would require a shared state and it's not available. But um, continuable is not designed for such purposes <coughs> where you are doing like optimization on the evaluation based on, on, on the graph. So also because we are only doing lazy evaluation, we can also provide more primitives to chain continuals together. Like there's also when sequ sequential or when sec, which invokes the continuals in a sequential <coughs> order. We could possibly then go ahead and think about new primitives that chain continuals together, like such as and when pooled, which makes sure that only a fixed amount of continuals are running at, um, at, at, at the same time, or uh, when every, which requests all continuals, so because when sequ sequential or when all were just abort when there was any exception um, uh, thrown in the chain. Or a possible when first succeeded or when first failed, 
which um, goes ahead when, when the first continuable failed or um, succeeded. So this will take exception strategies into account. And this moves like the responsibility from the execution up from the executor to the invoker, which is a good thing because it makes it possible for you to choose the evaluation strategy. And also because we are doing unwrapping by default, we can do that because our split execution path, con um, connections in continuable look quite nicely. Like a call to when all on a continuable which um, returns it just int as asynchronous result, will then just go ahead and append like the arguments on each other so we can accept, uh, um, access A and B nicely here. So A is the result of the first operation, B is the result of the second operation. Whereas in the future pattern, it looks like, um, yeah, not quite readable because again, you have to unwrap a lot and actually the arguments passed to when all are wrapped as a tuple. So this produces an, or introduces an immense amount of code overhead. And, but the advantage of this is that you have some more fine-grained exception handling, but usually you don't need this. So, as I told you, I was doing Google Summer of Code last year. I did a project at the HBX project of the Stellar Group. The HBX project is a library for concurrency and parallelism, and they provide also some kind of a future primitive. And they're also having some kind of a connection facility, like when any, when some, wait all, which um, waits on the current thread, and um, other primitives. But the important part of this is that my project was about um, rewriting those facilities in order to remove um, code duplication and also to improve those facilities. So, I was looking for some facility which makes it really possible or easy to implement such connection chaining mechanism. And for me, it was more like, yeah, it turned out that only three helper methods are, um, are needed to, to, to express such primitives. Like I came up with the approach that we would need a map pack method, which could map an arbitrary argument pack. An arbitrary argument pack is an argument or, or a variadic pack which can contain homogeneous containers like um, std, top, uh, std vector or std list or heterogeneous containers like a tuple. And then it could like remap the arguments that are deeply nested inside of it. And also there's some kind of a synchronous um, traversal needed and it is called traverse pack. It just traverses like the argument, so it doesn't remap map it, it's just for performance reasons. And there was also some primitive needed, I call it the traverse pack async um, function and it is possible for this that we traverse some, some kind of an arbitrary pack asynchronously and we can suspend the current traversal nicely without using coroutines. So, I will show you an example. So, when any, as implemented in continual, just returns or um, results in, the, in one argument. So, we can't like differentiate between the continual which actually produced that result, and we want to fix that now. We could then just go ahead and write something like an index continuals function, which then could return like a tuple of continuables where it, each continuable also has its index in the pack as argument. And we can use map pack to do that. So map pack again, like we are passing our continuables to it. They are produced by the do something um, function here and we are passing our indexer to the map pack. The indexer looks like the following. So again, it's a callable um, type and we are, we are making sure because of Esfine that um, only continuables are passed to the call operator. Like in the, the is continuable trait is provided in the library. And then we can just like have some kind of a global index. It's like here on top. Um, initially, it's zero, 
And then we would then go ahead and increase the index and resolve the continuable. Then we are passing the in or returning the index from the continuable while appending its first size. That's quite easy, I would say. And it turns out that this can work like also like with nested packs, as shown here. Like, for instance, we could also write, um, implement some kind of an aggregate function, which accepts a tuple of int, which also then accepts a continuable of int, and, and so on. And also a vector. And then we could then just pass this tuple to the when all method or function, and then it will like substitute all continuables with its result. That's the result here. We could then just go ahead and um, collect the integers with um, w through the traverse pack method, and um, then we aggregate it together. So it turns out because map pack can work with um, plain values and uh, such nested arbitrary packs when when all can does can do that too. Yeah. So later. Um, uh, because you were asking, I was originally implementing this facility, the map pack, traverse pack, and the traverse pack async function for the HPX project, but later I took it into continuable. So connections are implemented in a way, for instance, when all or when sequential, that we are invoking it with such an arbitrary um, argument pack, and then we could just map this pack with like some kind of a boxify mapper, which then just um, maps every continuable to a box, and the box can also hold the asynchronous results. Like this is some some kind of an uh, instead expected type, and then we would just traverse the whole pack and ap append like um, handlers to the continuable to dot then, which then resolve the expected um, container, and. Then we would just have an counter which counts how many continuals still have to be resolved. And as soon as the counter has reached zero, we are sure that our that our expected classes were filled with the values, and we just go ahead and unwrapping them again with unwrap. So those facilities made it quite simple to to express those connections. And because we are writing the sh um, the, the expected classes are like independent ZAP objects, we can write to them concurrently without having race conditions. We can also express some connections um, through the through operator overloading, and this is some kind of a C++ syntactic sugar thing. And um, here we will just do two requests, and we call then the end operator on the continuables, and then we could later just get the result of both asynchronous operations. Also, we can um, do an any chaining to the OR operator, and here we would just wait 20 seconds, or we wait until the space key is pressed, or the enter key is pressed. And um, so this kind of operator, um, oper operator overloading allows ex expressive chaining of um, continuables. There was one difficulty I want to talk about, and it's like um, <coughs> that if we are chaining the continuables together with some operator, then a naive approach would be to just connect two continuables together. But this would result in an invalid, uh, invalid evaluation tree. For instance, here wait until and wait key pressed would be called would be passed to when any, and when any would be then used in another when any and uh, and wait key pressed. So this could lead to um, unintended results. And actually, what we want is something like this: that all three arguments are passed to when any. I implemented it like that that if we are doing operator chain or operator, or if we call an operator on a continuable, the, um, the, this wouldn't like immediately um, create the connection. It would rather defer it to a, some la later point until no more continuable is added to, to the hierarchy. And for this, um, the continuable basis used, and as I told, 
you before, like the continuable base has a, some kind of a strategy template argument, and the strategy template argument um, just stores the current strategy with a, which is applied, and and then we would just go ahead and when we are calling dot then, and then we see yeah there was some strategy that is ongoing, and then we can apply the strategy afterwards. This is also this, this principle is also known some as as, as an expression template. And um, actually, yeah, it solves the problem quite nicely. Last but not least, I also want to talk about continuables and the coroutines TS. And the continuable um, inter interoperability with coroutines is quite good because we could um, resume the current coroutine um, when like a continuable has finished its work to call coavait, and we can also resolve a continuable when we finished a co co um, the current coroutine frame through co-return. And this is because continuable base implements the operator co-await and specializes the coroutine trains and that's why it is compatible to the coroutine TS. So also like other stuff is working as well like um, the exception propagation. Um, yeah. So, and the last question I want to answer is, do we even need continuable in times of coroutines? So, and I want to say to you, there are many things a plain coroutine can't provide. So, a coroutine isn't necessarily allocation-free. For instance, when a coroutine calls it recursive, calls it, it itself recursively, or, and the um, allocation elision also, um, depends on compiler optimization. So connections aren't provided by the coroutines PTS because coroutines are somehow some kind of a low-level primitive. Also executors are like difficult to, um, to apply to coroutines and here continuable is an, ad an, ad an advantage. So, and also it takes a lot of time until coroutines are widely supported. This even becomes worse when you're working in a legacy code base and there are still libraries that work with plain callbacks. But I need to say, coroutines have much better call stacks, so they are much nicer for debugging. So, this was my talk. Thank you for your attention. If you want to, um, want to take a look again at the slides, you can find them here in the link at the left side. Or if you want to browse the code, it is here in the link at the right side. And if you um, have any questions, talk to me just after the talk or write me a mail. And um, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the talk, and uh, I have a question about the when function, which takes this uh, max pack of uh, results, and uh, also takes the tuple of indexes and when vector of results. And the question why it cannot be just tuple of optional, and then just check the op what optional are initialized, and it's clearly say what features are resolved. Um, that's a good question. So the question was about, yeah, why we are in when any using like only one argument, right? Or having only one result argument here, right? Uh, Whereas we could just use like an, um, an, a pack of optionals to reflect which continual became ready, right? And for me personally, um, I implemented when any in a naive approach such that we are using std invoke once or call once, and um, so, yeah, you're right, we could possibly do that, but I did it that way, but um, in the future, I really want to provide, um, in the library, that's somehow an improvement, I provide, want to provide some facility, which makes it also possible for you to express like connections in a way you want to. So this would be another, just another way to implement it, but I think it's a good idea and maybe I take it into account and it could be really usable probably, right? And I uh, have another question about the materialization. Yeah. Uh, it takes like, okay, we have make any, 
and uh, what if I have make any and inside I have make uh, when, when all. So it's like mixing uh, and and or together. Does materialization correctly handle this situation because it's like complicated logic logic operation? Yeah, um, the materialization, like there, I think there are two rules where the materialization is applied. Like one rule is when we need a continuable, like for chaining it through a call to dot then, or if the strategy changes. And there are multiple strat or possible um, template arguments for the strategy. Like I will show you here. Um, so each um, actually connection strategy has its own strategy connection tag. And the strategy connection tag is stored in the continuable base as template argument. And thus we exactly know which to which strategy we are currently appending. And then we know, yeah, if the strategy changes, we are just um, doing the materialization. So it takes that into account. Did that answer your question? <laughs> Let's talk later, okay? Um, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering, you had this example with the um, wait until and then do basically when any of some timeout and then do something else. Uh, if you have on the when any branches something that might even continue on the graph a lot, is there any kind of facility to cancel that part of the graph so that you could implement something like a timeout with just doing a when any, have a um, wait until there somehow, and then if the timeout exceeds, then everything else is just dropped? Um, so this question was about cancellation mechanisms. And the thing is, you could e um, at any, you could like just implement like a timeout through chaining two asynchronous operations together, where one is the asynchronous operation, and the second one is like your timer, which is going out. And then you could just see which one of these. But um, continuable overall is um, really designed to um, be like a location agnostic and like some kind of a cancellation token, um, which is required for canceling like operations. This also involves some kind of a memory allocation and also does not really support it in this library. However, you can maybe interrupt with executors or implement some kind of your um, own cancellation mechanism. Like I, I really tried like in the implementation of the library to um, took things out which are not needed by most of the users. And but you, yeah, I think I thought about like that you could maybe also create one cancellation token for the whole asynchronous control flow, also by introducing another asynchronous side channel like the result or the, the exception <laughs> channel. And um, yeah, did that answer your question? Mm, I think I have an idea of how I would approach that problem, yeah. So okay. thank you. Hi. Um, if I understood correctly, um, you're still doing um, dynamic allocation in the um, continuation. Um, do you have any way to influence that or con configure that uh, ABI to pass allocator or something mm -hmm. like that? Um, so, yeah, actually there is some point um, or way to do that, but it's not um, provided by continuable. So continuable just can pro, um, work with any type erasure wrapper. So you could even provide your type erasure wrapper that f um, that um, fits like, or that that um, that that some that fits some requirements, right? But um, as I said before, the, my function two library is used for that, and function two also supports S um, allocators by default. So you could just like use function two, um, specialize it with your allocator of choice, and then just instage the continuable base um, with, um, with the 
customized version of function two like um, like it is here. Actually, you would just have to um, change the function two like um, like here, and um, then like change it in a way that it also uses your specific allocator. Okay, thanks. So thank you. Um, if you have. <laughs>